Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning for day three of the virtual face-to-face -face conference. I'm just going to go ahead and get us started as folks file in. Um, so yes, welcome. This is Getting the Grant, Beating the Odds, the first of two face-to-face -face sessions today. Um, so we're glad you're here to join us. My name is Kinsey Keck. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with brown hair. It's down a little bit past my shoulders. I'm wearing a uh, some large round wire framed glasses and a navy blue button up collared shirt. And uh, my background is blurred. I am also the programs director here at the round table. So for those who don't know, the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable is a grassroots service organization that works to improve and advance the state of arts education in New York City, New York State, and beyond. We do that through professional development, workshops, advocacy, um, and online resources and platforms to connect the arts education field. Although we are currently meeting this morning via Zoom online, the roundtable would like to acknowledge that we work and live on unceded lands, so Manhattan or the place that is widely known as New York City, exists on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Canarsi, Mansi Lenape, and Wappinger people. These sovereign nations and communities are still thriving here and we continue to occupy their lands. So we would like to give a moment of respect to them as well as to the black and immigrant communities that helped build the city that we know today. As we recognize that all of our pasts, presents and futures are intertwined, we would like to lift up uh, again, a handful of contemporary indigenous arts organizations that we can all support and learn from. So I put those links in the chat if you haven't had a chance yet. I highly encourage you to save those links, learn about these organizations, support them with donations if you can, uh, do some research on your own area if you're not in this area. And I also welcome you throughout today's session to put links in the chat for uh, other organizations that you would like to highlight to folks on the call today. Thank you. Uh, now just a quick word to thank our incredible sponsors for the face-to-face -face conference. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so we are just so grateful to their continued support. Uh, this session today specifically is brought to you by three of our sponsors. So I'd like to thank them. Um, Lotus Music and Dance, Leap NYC, and Surface Impression. So you can learn more about our sponsors on the sponsor tab on our conference website. You'll be hearing a lot about them throughout the conference, um, but just want to again, express our gratitude for them making the conference possible. All right, just a couple other things. Number one, if you're having trouble with Zoom, please message me. My name is Kinsey, I'm here to help. Um, <clears throat> please do keep your mic on mute, make sure that it's on mute throughout the session, unless you're the person speaking, so we can all hear each other clearly. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, we do encourage you to use the chat. You can put questions in there, connect with other folks on the call. We'll be keeping an eye on it and try to address as many questions as come through today. I also want to acknowledge that this meeting does include live ASL interpretation, as well as automatic closed captioning. To um, access captions, you'll just navigate to your your toolbar, there will be captions either on the main toolbar or under the more button, and then you can click show captions and you'll have them show up from there. And lastly, this session is being recorded. It will be made available to you all at the conclusion of the conference. We will try to get those resource resources uploaded and sent out to you as soon as possible. But with all the conference goings on, it may take a little time. So please do be patient with us. And I think that that is it for me. So now it is my pleasure to bring on our presenter for today. Please everyone join me in welcoming Lorraine Goodman. Lorraine is the executive director at Westrick Music Academy. 
Rain, we're so happy to have you here. Welcome. Yeah. Happy New Year. Thank you, Kelsey, uh, Kinsey. My name is Lorraine, and um, I, even though I'm currently uh, headquartered in Princeton, New Jersey, I actually spent most of my uh, formative development and uh, nonprofit years in New York City uh, and Brooklyn. Um, so uh, working at a variety of nonprofits and performing arts organizations, um, after having a career actually as a performer on Broadway. So I'm um, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Lorraine, I use she, her pronouns and uh, my background is blurred. I am a white woman um, with kind of reddish hair. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, getting the grant. Um, before we start, I did want to uh, do a, a little poll just to kind of get a sense of who's in the room. The virtual room and um if can you pull up that poll or do, do i have to stop sharing my screen no i can launch it now awesome so this is just to get a sense of who's in the room and you know what your experiences are so these are just some general categories if you could say you know what is your comfort with grant writing um uh, is it uh, you're new to grant writing um, or you have some experience, but, you know, you could use some help or that you're pretty experienced and you just want to see what other tidbits are out there? All right, here we go. All right. OK, that's pretty good. Um, so um, that's good to know. Um, this is uh, this uh, webinar will um I hope bring some additional information, maybe some kind of different insights for some of you that uh, have experienced. And for those of you who are new, I hope this will give um, your thoughts about grant writing a little more shape. Um, so um, this is today's agenda. Let's see if I can move this out of the way a little bit. Um, uh, key stages of successful grant proposals, understanding and knowing the funder uh, who who are you approaching? Because how you write and how you approach is very much based on the person that you're, who's your audience, right? Um, uh, providing sustainability. What does sustainability mean? Um, building your case for support. Um, that's how do we, how do we measure impact in the arts? Uh, arts and education might be a little bit easier, but not always. And then additional materials you need, right? You always need a project budget, um, additional support, who else is funding you? Who else is playing in your, your sandbox? Um, one sheets, testimonials, uh, project outcomes, and then how do you find sources of support? Um, and then I also have a, a page or so of resources. And then we'll end with time for questions and answers, hopefully. Um, one thing uh, about this, um, I hope I won't go too quickly. If you have questions, please put them in the question box. And at some points, I'll, I'll stop and uh, see where we are and catch up, all right? Um, but feel free to make this as interactive as we can in a webinar. Okay, so I found this quote, a grant application is not science. It is the marketing of science. And I love this quote because um, I find marketing and development are very much the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. And also um, marketing is being able to tell a good story, right? And that's what fundraising is. How do you tell your story? Uh, so um, anyway to share that quote with you. Um, this slide, I have a hand holding a bag that says grants on it, just uh, for those of you who can't see the slides. So what makes a winning proposal? Um, uh, there are a couple of things uh, that you need to consider, like what are the skills and tools that you need to complete your proposal and what are the obstacles? Um, if people have ideas of obstacles, please feel free to put them in the chat. But here are some of them that I uh, see frequently, right? Um, one of the things you need is you need to have a deep understanding of the organization and the program that you're writing about. Um, this is often why when you hire an outside grant writer, um, 
they're not necessarily as effective as you want them to be unless you give them deep understanding and tools, right? Um, I can give a perfect example of where I am right now. Uh, so at Westrick, we are very much a tuition-based choir. Many of the schools, the public schools and private schools in the area also have choirs. So why are we different from that? After, you know, reading, I'm new to the organization and I was reading proposals in the past and none of them addressed that. And then I heard our artistic director say, we can't use that venue because the kids perform in that venue because it's their school. We have to elevate what we have to offer is something different, right? Ah, that was an aha moment for me. So a deep understanding of the organization and what makes your organization unique, right? A deep understanding of the funder. What does the funder want? Where are they uh, funding? Um, are they like... In me, my case, we're in Mercer County. Mercer County has two different uh, main areas. There is Princeton and then there's Trenton. And even though we are only about eight miles apart, there are miles apart in terms of uh, needs, resources. So is a grant writer who's going to fund in Trenton necessarily going to fund us and vice versa. Um, awareness and understanding of your organ, the funders awareness of your organization. So um, I tell too many stories, but that's okay for now. So I was at an organization in Trenton actually, and um, I was trying to find some new funders and I had an associate bring to me the name of a, a very large, very, very large, deep pocketed uh, foundation in the area that had um, basically, their name is on the, the public library and they had funded the whole renovation of that library. And I kind of chuckled because they don't have an online application. They don't have an online website. And he said, well, I found this phone number Right. So I figured, what the hell? I called the phone number and the phone number was a law firm that directed me to another office that directed me to a third office that ended up on a voicemail. So I left a voicemail. Two days later, I got a text from one of the trustees saying she wanted to speak with me. A month later, we had a three year grant of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. How did that happen? It happened because Betsy, um, this funder, had recently joined a circle of women that um, gave money out as a group. And through that group, she had heard about our organization. So when I reached out to her, we were primed. Primed and ready. She knew about us. She had an awareness and an understanding already before I reached out. That was luck. but. Part of this is luck, right? Um, so, and communication with prospective funder and an opportunity to build connections. So that kind of just follows along with what I just told you, right? And communication is vital. FaceTime being there and a, a modicum of luck. Okay, know the funder. So this has a graphics, a, a lot of graphics on it. One that says it's a bunch of, uh, uh, what are those dice that say, please give. Um, and then we have a couple of things over on the right-hand side. So the first one is foundation versus government versus corporate giving. Each is different in how they, uh, how they approach grants and what they wanna see. So the first one is, is it a trust, who's reading your application? Is it a trustee or is it a panel? Because foundations are often run by trustees, meaning that you can create a relationship with those people who are the trustees of that foundation and they will get to know your organization and you can build relationships with them. Government grants are generally uh, determined by panels. Panelists can be 
different people each year, each cycle. Um, in New Jersey, at our New Jersey State Council of the Arts, it's it they not only get panelists every, for different panelists each time, those panelists for, are from out of state. So they may have absolutely no knowledge of your organization. That's important, right? Thirdly, we talk about corporate marketing versus corporate foundations. Corporate marketing is one bucket at a corporation, whereas a corporate foundation is a different bucket. So understanding, are you reaching a marketing department because marketing, they wanna know what's in it for them? Or are you talking to a foundation, which is gonna be slightly different. Now, in today's world, corporate and marketing and foundations are kind of getting closer and closer together. They're merging a little bit. Um, they still have two separate buckets, but their goals can be more aligned. Um, and then finally, are they asking for a letter of inquiry or a proposal? Because you do need to address those differently. So I'm gonna talk about those in a little more depth. Um, an LOI is a letter format. It should be addressed to a person. Um, you should be able to find who that person is, whether it's on GuideStar or a website or um, any other type of uh, investigation that you can do. Um, but it should be to a person. It should be signed by a senior executive. And it can take a little bit more of a personal tone. A proposal is more in a narrative format. Um, it's not signed, but it can be accompanied by a cover letter, depending on the format, which I'll talk about in a second. And it does need to be a little more formal. Today, most proposals are done online, right? Um, and with strict, strict, sometimes crazy word or character limits. Um, I'm working on a proposal right now that literally asks you for the history of your organization, your mission, and why you're applying to them in 750 characters. It's kind of crazy. We use a lot of at signs and plus signs, but um, uh, and 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 abbreviations, which is not generally a good practice. But um, some still request sort of a formal proposal that you can email in. If you don't know where to start in your proposal, like if you're, if you're new, one of the new uh, people, this um, this website, uh, philanthropynewyork.org slash resources slash NYNJ dash area dash common dash application uh, has what they call the New, new York, New Jersey common application. This application will give you a good framework. Uh, it's a template that has a good framework for uh, putting your, uh, if, you, if you have to start from scratch. Um, by the way, this entire deck will be mailed, emailed to everyone. So if you can't copy that uh, long URL, um, you'll have it to just link on later. So well, before we go back into um, the government versus foundation, uh, I want to take a pause and see if there are any questions. Do we have any questions so far? In the chat? All right, look. Um, okay. Sounds good. All right. So foundation versus government. Um, this is a slide that shows kind of the difference laid out with just bullet points. Um, both must contain clear, concise language that builds a case for support. Follow the guidelines. Use the guidelines actually as um, your outline for what you're gonna talk about. Even numbering sometimes, one, two, three, if that fits within your character limit. Um, you need to fill, you know, fit within the parameters of the funders giving guidelines. Corporate versus foundation versus sponsorship. Um, corporate foundations, oftentimes those proposals are available online. 
um, you have to show quantifiable objectives and otherwise uh, it can work like other foundation entities. Sponsorships um, are more, uh, again, maybe um, relationship-based. Uh, you have to think like a marketer and you have to think of a quid pro quo. You know, what, what, what are you giving them? That's why sometimes they'll ask, you know, what kind of marketing opportunities are available. Um, the other thing, though, I'm going to talk about with corporate foundations is I have found them to be very elusive unless you have a personal connection, uh, unless you have a board member who sits, uh, who works at that organization, unless you are able to make uh a connection of some sort. Um, I will tell you for m and Bank, for example, um, this is a crazy story, it'll, it'll come up later. But I, um, when I was working at Big Brothers Big Sisters, we applied to F4 m and Bank uh, for the first time to see if we could get funding for one of our uh, events and got turned down cold, nothing. Then I reached out to somebody I know who introduced me to somebody else who introduced me to a program manager at m and um, And when I reached out to her, she immediately said, yes, I'd love to come. I'd love to meet with you. So we set up a time to meet and we I walk into her office and she says, oh, so lovely to meet you. I'm a good friend with one of your board members. I kind of didn't know what to say at that point because that board member had been on our board for eight years and had never once mentioned that she knew the program officer at M&T Bank. Anyway, the PS to that story is we did get a grant finally, but it was because I had that personal uh, introduction and made that personal connection. Um, so this is a graphic that says, uh, it's a cartoon that says, why are we doing this? And uh, it's a man talking to a woman uh, in an office. And uh, at the bottom it says, quote, it's not a great mission statement, but we'll revise it if things get better. I don't know. I thought it was funny. All right. Sustainability. Questions the funders will going to want to ask and want to know about. And you need to consider what happens when the funding period is over? Will the program continue or will it go away? What if the funders guidelines change? Uh, we have that in New Jersey. We have an organization that used to fund the arts. No problem. They've changed their priorities. So what happens to the program? What if the trustees decide to sunset current funders for a period of time? That can happen as well. So these are things I, one of the, that you'll see in another slide, um, development should follow programming, not the other way around. All right. So you want to give, be able to give the grant maker the confidence that this program is going to continue, that it's going to be okay without your, without that, that funder's money, right? Um, they want to know who else is playing in your playground. So if they leave the playground, you know, the playground is still a popular place. Could it move towards self-sufficiency, right? Will it be attractive to other funders, right? Who else is going to play in that playground? And then how are you going to evaluate your programs? And I'll talk about that later. The best proposals make funders want to be part of the change you're making, whether that's a social organization or an arts organization. They want to be excited by your mission. They don't want to feel that they're funding a, a loser, right? So you never want to feel like you're saying you're desperate or a loser. And that's so hard today with all the... The, the difficulty that arts uh, organizations are facing because of the pandemic. Um, preparing a prospect list. How do you prepare a prospect list? Um, 
you could look for a match, right? You could go on to foundation search and, and try to enter your, your guidelines and see what comes up. Uh, that's the first step, right? Then you need to prioritize based on your resources. How many people do you have in your development department? Are you like me, where it's one person who is also the executive director and deals with a hundred other things? Or do you have a, a, a fund, a, a institutional funding department where you have 15 people? Um, what's your timeline, right? Do you have a long timeline, long lead? Do you have a three days? Uh, and then how do you collect your background information? Do you have collateral ready to go, verbiage ready to go, or do you need to create stuff? Um, especially if you have a new program that you're looking to fund, do you need to create collateral about that? Um, and then where can you look? I mentioned foundation search there. These are subscription sites, right? We have foundation search, foundation center, guide star, GuideStar, I guess, is um, free-ish. If you want to get deeper in the weeds, you have to have a paid subscription. There's Grant Station. There's Chronicle of Philanthropy. Chronicle of Philanthropy, you can get a free uh, subscribe to their um, request for proposal alerts, right? Um, so some of those are, are more accessible without a huge down payment. But what else can you do if you don't have funds to look? Look at programs and annual reports of similar organizations, right? Look to, you can look on their website. Oftentimes they'll list their funders face to face, right? They listed their funders. Who, who else funds arts education programs that you are, that are similar to yours? If they're interested in another program like yours, they may be interested in you as well, right? Best yet, this goes back to my meeting at m &T, right? Best yet, ask your board who they know. Because a warm introduction is much better than a cold ask every single time. More guidelines. Plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. I, I've started using Asana uh, to track what I need to do. I love the free version of Asana. It lets you track things. Um, there are other things that you can use. You can use, oh gosh, I don't know some of the other ones, Slack. Um, I also use Salesforce to track deliverables, but plan ahead, make sure you have, you know, um, sometimes these online applications, I was working with somebody and she's like, yeah, I can't get past the first page without uploading something. And I'm like, well, just upload anything and then go to the next page so you can see what the whole application looks like before you start. That's really important. I often will take, um, you should be able to download now a list of the questions and then convert it into a Word document or a Google document so you can work offline. Um, so that's gathering your information and devising a plan. Who's going to do what? If you have a large organization, you may want to um, ask other people especially in a big proposal to help you with certain pieces, your finance piece, your budgets, right? Your, your collateral. Um, track your outcomes. And again, I'll have a, we talk about that later. Um, see what their guidelines say. If they do have a website, sometimes they'll say, call us before applying. Sometimes they'll have um, webinars that you can go to. And I advise, even if you know the organization, go to the webinar just so you can get a sense if things have changed and get your face out there to create that connection. If appropriate, um, find someone who can facilitate an introduction. Uh, maybe it's a board member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a current funder, right? Maybe if a current funder, a lot of uh, trustees at organizations may sit on the board of other foundations, or they may know people. You can look on LinkedIn to see if they know somebody else. And you can say, hey, you know, you've been a great friend to our organization. We noticed that this funder over here um, might be interested in what we do. Can you facilitate an introduction? 
worst thing they could say is I don't feel comfortable doing that, but they may say absolutely. Um, whenever possible, call first or find out from them to see if it is a good fit. Your proposal. Okay, how do you build a case for support? You want to introduce your organization with a specific ask. This is really important also for an LOI and letter of inquiry. I My first job um, after I got my master's was working for an organization that actually gave money away, which was fabulous. And my job was to read proposals and then recommend or uh, recommend action or inaction, I suppose, um, on these proposals. I can't tell you how many proposals I read that just said, we want to partner with you. I don't know what that means. So you need to ask. If you're going to, if you're asking for money, ask for money. Um, we respectfully request that you consider our proposal for $10,000 grant to help support our arts and education programs that provide kids uh, with access to the theater. It can be better than that, but you need to make an ask. Generally, they're gonna ask for mission and history. Um, you should have that text ready to go. Uh, program description, project outcomes and evaluation. What are your demographics? Whom do you serve? Uh, the other day I was working on a grant proposal and we, um, until recently, we did not collect uh, demographics as considered generally um, in terms of race and uh, cultural background on our uh, students. But I saw a paragraph in a proposal that had been written by a previous, uh, actually marketing person, um, who she is hearing impaired. And she wrote that we have students of all kinds of, um, with all kinds of disabilities, including ADHD, autism, and um, uh, uh, seeing disabled. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, that sometimes I forget that that is part of demographics, right? Um, so try to be um, ex incredibly inclusive in your description of, of demographics. Um, a short paragraph, you might wanna include a short paragraph of organizational management and fiscal position. So you could, you're you also going to include generally uh, organizational budget and oftentimes they wanna see your financial statements or a 990, but you can include a short paragraph that says we are led by a you know involved board of 13 or 15 or however many um, board members from the community. Our staff includes, you know, however many people uh, full-time and part-time and um, maybe even break down between administrative staff and artistic staff. And then um, mention, you know, your fiscal health. And you can be um, pretty straightforward about that and what you're trying to do about that if it's not in a healthy place. Um, so this is what I was saying early. Programs drive development, not the other way around. I have been off, off I, I remember being asked by executive directors, oh, I just saw this grant opportunity. Should we start a program, la, 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 so we can be eligible for this grant? My answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're going to do that program anyway, don't rely on a grant to start a program. Um, and also remember, programs are what make you unique. And that shouldn't be like negative towards other organizations. It's just what makes you unique and different. Um, always try to link any type of program to your mission. Describe the program, be as specific as you can, especially given the word limit um, or character limit, 
and then talk about whom this serves. Include demographics. Remember to be as wide in your your use of the word demographics as you can be, um, and also the size of your constituency pool. And then obviously evaluations and outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. Um, this slide is about uh, the ask, which I talked about earlier, um, and make sure you're specific about what you want. And then I have a little text here that's better than what I came up with uh, on the fly. On behalf of the organization, we respectfully request a grant of la, 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 la. And then um, why, what you're gonna do with that money. A successful proposal is short. Um, this is if it's not online and you're just uh, creating something that you will email, make sure it's five pages or uh, and or shorter, um, unless of course you're doing one of those government grants that can be 40 or 100 pages. Um, but those are generally prescribed exactly what uh, is needed online. Um, as clean as you can possibly get it, uh, no typos. Um, I am the queen of typos, so I always have to make sure at least two other people read what I write, because sometimes I just see what I think I wrote and not what I actually put on paper. Make sure it's legible. Um, it should not be a teeny weeny font so you can make it, you know, five pages, but with a teeny weeny font. Um, if, you, if you have room, you can use bullet points. Um, but again, you may, uh, that may be difficult given the parameters. Um, it should be relevant. It needs to reflect your mission specific and transparent. They're gonna be able to see um, if you write something that is blatantly false or that's hyperbolic, uh, you don't wanna exaggerate or, or use, um, it's the best program ever, unless you're quoting a kid who says, says that, right? You wanna be clear about what your program is, but, but be careful about using too many adjectives. Uh, it's old old adage about show, don't tell. And be positive. That's also critical because um, I'll give you an example. Um, I used to work at Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Mercer County, and we were regularly confused with the Boys and Girls Club. Like Everyone, including funders, including people who worked there at both organizations, would confuse. So the boys and girls, no, it's it's big brothers, big sisters. And I started addressing that in applications and saying, we are not big, you know, we are not boys and girls club, but we love the boys and girls club. We think they're an awesome organization and we'd like to partner with them on occasion. But they work in groups. Big brothers, big sisters is one on one. That's the difference not negative towards them, right? It's just saying there's a difference. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite uh, writing uh, memes or, or rules. It's KISS. KISS means keep it simple, stupid. Um, so <laughs> you don't have to be believe the stupid part of it. But keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. Uh, don't use words like hyperbolic. Don't use acronyms. Don't make somebody flip three pages to find out what your acronym actually means. Um, just keep it as simple as you can, straightforward uh, declarative sentences. Okay. Now we get to the fun part, management and finances. I mentioned to include a narrative, in your narrative, a short uh, bit about your uh, finances. And I have a little cartoon here that says, how much of Robin Hood's money went to fundraising expenses and campaign contributions and how much actually went to the poor? Um, that's a kid asking his dad who's reading him a book about Robin Hood. So that's, you know, um, back in the day, campaign monitor, uh, campaign, nav uh, charity navigator, sorry, charity navigator uh, used to report that and they gave you a low score if you 
had too much money that went to overhead. Um, people are revising, revisiting that these days. Uh, it's not such a negative, but it is something to consider. How much money is actually going to your programs? And part of this can be um, how you look at money that goes to your programs. As the executive director at Westrick, um, I spend a good 20, 30% of my time doing tour management, um, uh, working with parents, uh, running our tour, our summer tours and putting that together. If, and not, if, at least 30% or not more. That part of my salary should go towards programs in our audit, right? Um, so make sure that you include marketing time, the executive director's time in your program budgets. Um, in this short paragraph, you might want to mention the size of your budget, mention any irregularities that might be flagged in a in an audit so that you address them up front and give a short breakdown of where your money, uh, where funds for your organization come from. Are you mostly tuition based like we are? Do you get a lot of uh, corporate grants? Um, it can be, uh, you know, again, a short paragraph, but it explains what's happening later when somebody looks at your budget. Um, some supplemental supplemental materials. This is a, a good comprehensive list of things that they might ask for. Of course, they may ask for something else <laughs> that randomly, but um, uh, like I, there's an organization out here that always wants to see a strategic plan. Um, some organizations don't have a strategic plan, right? But cover letter, a board list. Some board lists just want a board list with their name, title, and their outside affiliation and how long they've served. Um, this organization wants to know name, title, how long they've served, when they roll off, what county they live in. I mean, <laughs> so you need to be prepared with all those variations. Um, financials, organization, the various different budgets and your most recent audit. Um, Additional support, who are your major funders? What is the status of those funding? Are you, is it pending? Is it confirmed? Is it received? And then those should be broken down. Again, I, I go into these in a little more detail. Um, you might wanna have a one sheet organizational overview. You know, who, who are you in, in the short marketing piece? Uh, Project leadership and key staff ba um, bios, have those ready to go. Maybe testimonials, list of awards, evidence of accomplishments. Um, at Theater for a New Audience, we just had a running document that had all that, like the OBs and whatever awards that were, uh, you know, and we just kept adding them so we had them ready to go. Prior project outcomes. These can be in the theater. They can be uh, reviews. They can be, um, uh, we'll talk more about outcomes, but there are a lot of different ways to measure uh, outcomes in the arts. And then of course your IRS determination letter. Uh, it's always good to include that. Okay, let's talk money. Ah, so here I have a picture of a monkey reading a book called How to Budget, Counting Banana Slices. I think those are banana slices. Um, organizational budget. Even if the funder does not ask for an organizational budget, you may want to have one ready anyway. And make sure that have a condensed version of your budget, right? Rather than having a budget that's like five pages, that's very granular, they don't need to see that. They really don't. Um, they just want a one to two page budget that's condensed. Um, balance is key. Make sure that you zero out your project income and expenses. So uh, it's kind of a little bit of a numbers game and maybe a little fictitious, but 
that you don't want to show too much of a surplus because then they say, why are you asking for my money? But if you show a deficit, then they go, well, you're not being fiscally responsible. So um, I like to zero out budgets uh, and keep in mind your budget will tell as much of a story as your narrative. And that's um, you want to make sure that the two pieces work together. Sometimes it can be useful to start with your budget. Um, program, project budget or program budget. Again, zero out your income and expenses. Uh, sometimes you don't need to even include income, but sometimes you do. Um, include percents of salaries of relevant personnel, like the executive director, marketing person, even the finance person sometimes. Uh, don't forget some marketing web overhead and other miscellaneous expenses. Those wouldn't be necessary if you didn't have your program. And then um, add in-kind support. Uh, there is a website you can find if you Google website value, uh, sorry, volunteer value, and it will tell you approxim the approximate hourly value of volunteers, even volunteers that are just stuffing programs. Um, add budget notes. I would emphasize over over explain in your budget notes. Um, it can't hurt and, and it can help. Keep in mind, be honest and be realistic. Top funders, break them down into foundation, corporate and government. Add a column to notate whether it's project, projected, confirmed or received. Add footnotes for specific project support, gala support. Um, you know, again, notate, notate. You have room to explain. So go ahead and explain. Your mission can be quixotic. Your funding list should not be. And quixotic is overly idealistic. So try to be realistic about your funding options. Okay, outcomes. How do you quantify the arts? Um, there are various different ways you can think about quantifying the arts, um, uh, especially in arts and education. Some programs, um, I know at Theater for a New Audience, they had very um, highly developed rubrics that they would do at the end of each program to see how uh, kids' uh, writing was affected, their reading skills were affected based on, and we got results back from the schools based on like their state testing. That That's awesome. Um, and and that is that is very developed and, and deep, uh, but sometimes it, the, the results or the, the, the quantifiable results aren't so obvious, right? So what other options can you use? What other metrics? So um, there are th these educational metrics. That's great. What about artistic feedback? How do the, your, um, for instance, in my organization, how do our directors feel about the program? Are they, do they feel that the students are growing? Do they feel that their students are engaged? Um, we're looking at doing surveys at the end of each year, which we haven't done in years to see uh, for the younger kids with their parents. Are the parents happy with their investment? Um, or is it, um, uh, do they feel like they're not getting money for their investment, that it's it's not worth the, the money and the travel time? Um, audience reaction, right? How do the audiences feel? Oh, sorry, artistic feedback can also be reviews, right? If you do get reviews in the paper, um, audience reaction is how big are your audiences? Are they coming? Right? Um, are they happy? Do they come back to the next concert? And then for us, for example, we have renewing students. Do students come back year after year? We find that 70%, 70 to 75% of our kids, and that includes graduating, you know, kids who are seniors. Um, they come back year after year. So that must mean, that must indicate to some extent that they're having a good time and that they find value in our program. So those are some of the metrics you can use. Um, 
the other metric you can use is our testimonials. And so, um, man, I love these. These are three pictures that I have from this year of our choirs. And you can see, for, for those of you who can see the photos, we have a lot of smiling faces. Um, ranging in from kids who are really young. Uh, those are probably like eight-year-olds in the red shirts to, um, and, and you can see that we have a very diverse group of kids to our older girls um, who are in their formal attire and they're taking a selfie, right? And they're smiling and smiling and, and grinning and seem very happy. And then we have two of the older boys in our young men's ensemble, uh, having a great time and one of them is wearing a Christmas hat that must be at our Christmas event. So those, I was at a, um, when I first started out, I was at a uh, meet the funders panel and one of them, one of the there were three panelists and one of the panelists was saying, you know, I just want to see, I don't show me the photos. I don't want to see the cute kids or the dogs. Just just tell me what numbers you have and what your your numbers are. And the woman sitting next to him looked at him with this like shocked look on her face and said, I love seeing the kids. What are you, I love seeing those pictures. So again, that's knowing your funder, right? That's the key, knowing your funder. Do they want to see the few kids or not? So the evaluation, right? These are things that, that they may ask. Is the director, the executive director, an effective leader with a capable and well-trained staff? Um, sometimes organizations are asking, how long has the executive director been in place? Does the organization have a proven track record in general? Does the organization have the capability of expanding to meet the community's increasing needs? And what is the overall situation, financial situation of the organization? Are they in good shape? Do they have a rainy day fund or an endowment? Do they have a board that gives? Those are all questions they may ask. Um, is the board of directors active or are they a paper board, right? Does the board financially support the organization? That's a critical one. Um, does the, and if they, if not everybody supports your organization on the board, make sure you can explain why. Do you have uh, artistic seats on your board that are exempt from having to make a financial contribution? It's okay, you just need to explain why. Does the organization have a written long-range plan and a, a mission statement developed with full participation of the board? Does everybody have buy-in? So this is a slide with a pop-up that is a, uh, a young woman with pink hair saying, yes, and very excited because they said yes. So what do you do if they said yes? Say thank you. That's the first thing is just say thank you. Maybe it's you pick up the phone or send an email immediately to say thank you. Of course, you'll send a, an official later letter later, but always try to be as quick as you can with that thank you. Um, maybe have a board member say thank you. Uh, complete any required paperwork. Uh, foundation, it may simply be a, a piece of paper that you need to say, thank you, yes, we accept. Uh, with a government contract, it may be an annoying, annoying contract. Um, but do whatever needs to be done. Add in any important dates to whatever software you were using. If it's Asana, if it's um, Salesforce. I always immediately look at the award letter and write down when your deliverables are due. When is your report due? Do you have to submit an interim report? What needs to be done, even if it's six months down the line? If you don't write it down, you will forget it. Uh, keep the funder informed what's going on. If you leave the organization, say you want to let the funder know that you left the organization. 
Um, so again, that, that uh, goes back to sustainability. They want to know that the organization is still going to be in good hands. Um, if you are uh, hiring a new development person, you want to introduce the new person, right? Um, and then make note about when and if you can uh, submit a renewal request, right? Do those things up front, and then you won't have to worry about them later. So that's if they said yes. So what happens if they said no? There is a strong impetus to kind of maybe rip the letter up, throw it out, and or the email, destroy it, and never think about that funder again. I would say that's not the right approach. Again, it's about building relationships. Remember, it's not personal, not personal. Um, it could be any reason why. So try to find out. Maybe they'll say, we're too busy. We can't talk to you, sorry. But many times they will say, yes, we're happy to talk to you. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a no, followed up by a meeting, and then a year later got a yes. So it's about meeting, um, because sometimes they'll clarify something that was unclear. And when you rewrite, when you write your proposal the following year, you make that more clear and you figure that part out. That's one option. A second option could be that the organization didn't know about you. Right? The funder's awareness of your organization. So the second time around, after you've made that call, you've had that introduction, you've had that talk over over Zoom or in person or over coffee. Now they know you. And you can send them more stuff. And then they go, you know what? Maybe I should fund that organization. And the second time around, they make the recommendation and you get the money. So do the do that work. If it's if it makes sense, you could also call um, somebody and say, you know what, we changed our funding priorities. You're not in our graphic, our demographic. You're not in our geological area. That's okay. Then you make a note about that. So if you do leave the organization, someone else takes your place. They don't make the same mistake you did. They don't waste their time with that organization. Um, and then finally, just seek out other options. There are always other options. So some closing thoughts before we go into some Q&A. So um, I, this is just a, a, the graphic here is a word cloud of, of things that I, words that I think are important. Um, passionate, worthy, compelling, um, evaluations, mission, honesty, honest, convincing, open. So you want to tell a compelling story. Um, when I worked at Theater for a New Audience, uh, so Theater for a New Audience was founded by Jeffrey uh, Harwitz, who still is, I think he's still there. Um, and Jeffrey is not a very uh, grammatically correct writer, shall we say. But Jeffrey has a vision for that organization, which is why it's grown so much. And his vision is very compelling. And he is able to put down on paper what he feels from here, from his heart. And when you read his uh, his 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 uh, artistic statements, you get why what he's doing and what he's trying to do with his organization in a very compelling way. And that just working with him taught me so much about grant writing because you need to have that passion in and you need to find a way to pour it into your grant writing, um, which is going to take me to a second uh, digression here since I have a little time, which is about chat GPT. Jet, chat GPT can be your good friend. Um, 
do y'all know, I hope you all know what chat GPT is. It's that open AI where you can create, you can put in a question uh, and a little information or maybe a previous grant that you've written and ask it to rewrite it and it will. And it'll take a minute or two to rewrite your text. Great. It can be a great starting page. So you're starting with something on, on a page rather than looking at a blank page. But it doesn't have this. And I'm pounding my heart. It doesn't have that compelling edge. And truth be told, if you are approaching a new funder, you need that heart. So use it as a draft, let it help you get going, but then you got to go in and play around with it a lot. So be passionate, be honest, and be specific. Um, so I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Kinsey, I don't know how we manage this, but I'm going to leave it to you for a sec. Yes, thank you, Lorraine. Um, we did have one question about exactly what you just touched on, the um, use of AI. So I feel like we've ticked that box. Um, also, uplifting that Marissa said, we hosted an entire workshop recently in grant writing using open AI strategies recently. Um, she says, you need humans though, to review and actually give the heart to the work still. Yes. <laughs> so folks, if you, if you have a question or a comment, you can pop it in the chat and we'll read it off. You're also very welcome to raise a hand. We can spotlight you and bring you on if you'd like to, um, be seen and heard. I do have um, on my slides uh, some resources. Um, let me share again uh, while we're seeing if anybody wants to pop up. Um, I'll talk through some of these resources. So these are some books that I recommend. Um, <laughs> perfect phrases for grant writing proposals. Um, so, I mean, these are just some ones, some that I've read some that I have not read, but these are just general ones, the uh, the top. And then um, this one down here, Reynold Levy's, uh, Yours for the Asking. If you haven't read it, it's it's pretty short and it's, it's kind of fun. Um, Reynold Levy was, uh, he was the head of Lincoln's Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center for I think 10 years or so. Uh, he worked at the, the uh, Memorials Fund, um, National International Memorials Fund, I think at some point. Um, anyway, he tells a lot of fun stories about uh, Beverly Sills and what a great fundraiser she was. And um, there are some very, very uh, charming anecdotes um, so I, I, it's, it's a, it's a fun read, but it also talks about, um, how fundraising is a calling. It's, it's not, it's like being a doctor or a lawyer, right? It's about finding passion for something. Um, this last one, uh, uh, it's a, an old book from 1991, but it has some really, really fine, uh, it's more of a workbook than, um, something you sit down and read. But it has some great, uh, great, very technical knowledge um, and examples of how to use it, how to put together a budget with um, worksheets and things like that. And also a good chapter on volunteer and, and in-kind donations. Um, this, uh, this page, this has a bunch of websites. Um, there was Grant Space. Um, Foundation Center uh, is another source for webinars as well as classes, free and paid. Um, and the Physical Center, which is way down uh, somewhere, Old Ferry, I think. Um, you can go there and use their uh, their uh, online search for free. Um, Foundation Search, which I happen to like, um, but uh, 
It's a little more expensive than the others. And then there's LinkedIn, which has an official uh, group of the AFP of Chronicle Philanthropy and has some great resources and questions. So I, do, I see we do have a question. Yes, yes. I don't know their name. It just says iPhone, but you're welcome to come off of mute and ask your question. Let's see. I'm going to ask to unmute. Yes, I think you you came off of mute for a moment and then it went back, so we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Nzinga. Um, I'm just, um, I have a question regarding, um, I'm an artist, but I work with nonprofits um, that maybe necessarily have not been previously as, as immersed in the art. And in working with me, they've become more interested because they've realized that it's sort of a gateway into the community that they are trying to um, work with um, in terms of uh, project, uh, project-based uh, uh, activities. And I'm just wondering, because the organization doesn't have a robust budget, how do we handle stuff um, or, uh, I guess, um, letters of inquiries or uh, proposals for foundations or, or people who would be willing to fund us, a small organization based in Brooklyn? Um, so if I understand correctly, you're you're saying, um, so they're, they're kind of new to the arts and they're looking for, uh, like how to find support to help in, in develop, building out their development. Is that sort of what you're without right. a lot so of they're, Yes, they're all, an organization that's been around for at least 20 something years, but in education. But the thing is in art, they have been working with me and they found that the programs have been successful. And so they're looking to expand and sort of get more funding for them to expand on art programming. Got it. And, and, um, I guess my question is, so they need to find, um, you know, look for, uh, kind of go back to that slide where I talked about um, the, the sort of the, um, you know, the, the process of being able to go through and say, uh, okay, so how do I start, right? Um, I need to, uh, let's see, um, you need to look for a match. So look at, they need to start developing a list of prospects, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's number one. And then um, figure out a plan of, of who's going, which, which of these prospects make the most sense to start with, right? Prioritize your prospects and funding needs. So start out. And then part of that is going to be creating like a an Excel spreadsheet of, you know, here are the 15 funders that could possibly be interested in us, number one. Number two, what is my ask gonna be, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a I, I remember looking at a, um, a proposal that was like a very, very extensive proposal and the maximum that we could ask for was like $2,000. Well, is mm -hmm. it worth my time to do something that's gonna take you know, 15 hours of my time to pull this together? Because the questions were very different you know, for $2,000, is that worth my time? Probably mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. right? So you prioritize your prospects and funding and then start collecting the, what you need to do and pull it all together. I mean, it's, it's as basic as that. It's, it's, um, uh, so I, if you don't have somebody to help you with, um, pulling that stuff together, you can, there are resources like Catch a Fire. So organizations do have to uh, subscribe to mm -hmm. uh, get volunteers, but you can get volunteers there who may help you with the grant writing. You can use Chat GPT to get you going, um, which is is free for the basic uh, subscription, you know, basic access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so those are so just some ways to get going. Is it a little bit more challenging, or I'm assuming because they don't have like a robust budget um, right now, and I, I think that that's one of the the executive director's issues is that they don't have the you know previous funding and stuff like that from uh, fund, fund funders, and yeah. so they they struggle with you know when funders look at them being limited in their budget, they're going to look at it. Okay, is this is this something that we have that that has potential? I think that's the worry or the, the concern. 
There are, yeah, there are some funders that will will help with uh, new organizations. Um, you can also look at government grants, which uh, there are some government grants that are subsidies of NISCA. Um, mm -hmm. I would look at some of those, which might uh, be useful because um, organizations that get money from NISCA are not eligible for some of these smaller ones. There's also mm -hmm. Art New York, which has some small grants that might help you. So I'd look at all those options and okay. look at organizations that are similar and see who funds them because somebody is funding them. And also talk to your board. Okay. Which should be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat now, which is great. Uh, I'll read you the first one, which is... Um, can you talk about reapplying for grants that you don't get, like when you should reapply? Would that be if your program changes or your priorities change? Gosh, I think that there are a lot of uh, sort of variables in that, that question. Um, first, I would say, did you get a chance to talk to the funder and what did they say? Um, I can tell you, uh, gosh, so um, I was at uh, at Big Brothers Big Sisters, and when I came in, uh, they had already submitted a proposal to an organization that does some capacity building, um, and it was for them to uh, get money to hire a web ex expert to redo their website, and they had been turned down. And um, we had a meeting uh, with the funder and he basically said to us, you know, we fund things that we can touch, you know, <laughs> touch. We want, we want to fund like computers and trucks and buses. You know, a website is not something we can touch. And he's like, I know that that sounds, you know, it is technology, but it's, it's not something we can touch. And that's why the trustees didn't think it was a, uh, a viable project. And and then he told us some of the other projects they had funded, which was computers. And at the time I was sitting um, on uh, my laptop from work that was from 2006, this is last year. And my Zoom fell, I was with my executive director and I had to keep rebooting my computer because it couldn't sustain Zoom. So I said, you mean like replacing this computer that I'm on right now? And he's like, yeah, that would probably be eligible. And when can we apply again? In a month. So he gave us the parameters. We reapplied, we applied for new computers, laptops so that our, our uh, team could work from home. And we were funded, fully funded for $7,000 to buy five new computers. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, some, I, you know, here's another example. Um, I don't, again, I don't know if this answers your question, but I was looking at Pros, uh, Providence Bank in um, in New Jersey, and I was looking at their website, and they said they fund organizations that are are, you know, within the the parameters of where they have offices or banks, and we were in Trenton, and Providence Bank had just closed down the last of their banks in Trenton. And I I was resigned not to apply, but I figured I'd reach out to the program officer and see, because they had uh, funded us in the past, but it had been a while. And I reached out to her. She agreed to meet with us. And we had a, a meeting over Zoom. And she said, um, actually, that her trustees had just said to her, you can expand into Trenton, even though we don't, we no longer have banks there. And we ended up getting a two-year uh, grant of fifteen thousand um, dollars. So, again, you you need to check with the funder um, if it's an organization that won't talk to you. Um, that makes it more difficult to kind of figure out. But I've I've reached out on occasion and. I've had funders say back to me, I'm so glad you reached out to me. No one ever reaches out to me, even when they don't get a grant. Does that answer your question? I don't know if it does or not. 
I think we see, yeah, in the chat that's that this anecdotes are very helpful. Yes. <laughs> um, next we have from Amy. Um, I find a challenge is demonstrating need in a way that will resonate with a funder, um, but also with my personal goal to focus on asset-based language and highlighting the strengths of the community that we are supporting. Do you have any insight on that? Gosh. Um, <laughs> um, the thing that came to my mind was I was talking to a development director at Princeton University and I'm like, you know, I've been, it's like, how do you, if you're at Princeton University, which has an endowment of, I can't remember what it is, but it's like $32 billion. It's just insane. Um, how do you raise money for an organization like that? How do you ask people to give you money for Princeton University? And she said, excellence is expensive. Um, And uh, that occurred, like one of the things that I found at um, where I work right now. So we are very tuition based. Sixty to seventy percent of our our operating budget is is from tuition, and yet we're also looking at our tuition rates and what it actually costs us to run our programs. And it it's 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 a loss, a net loss. Even if everyone paid full tuition, we'd still lose money. So we need to build out our donation base. And we're mostly in Princeton. There is another organization in Trenton that charges nothing to participate. And so how do we put up ourselves against that organization uh, in, in, in terms of funding, right? Um, so one of the things that we're talking about is how unique our experiences are for young kids. Um, we sing, our kids have sung at Carnegie Hall several times. They've sung with uh, the famed mezzo-soprano Joyce DiDonato. They've sung with Yo-Yo Ma. Um, we try to create experiences that are um, deeper and heightened and a better musical experience than what they might find in, a, in their high school or junior high school. And so we try to emphasize that because that's what makes us unique and special and the bomb that the students create. So, you know, we're looking at, um, you can talk about being, uh, we're looking about cre expanding our resources, our access, so that no child is denied access to our programs because they can't pay the tuition. So that we create a scholarship-based program um, that's needs-based. Uh, I, I, does that, um, I think that that's, you want to show the need um, for the program without, I think what you're saying is you wanna show the need for the program without uh, denigrating the abilities of the people you serve. Is Am, am I reading that correctly? Please tell me if I'm not. Okay, cool. Right. Um, Sequoia's question is next. Um, Sequoia says, hello, and thank you for this wonderful workshop. I recently graduated from UPenn and launched a nonprofit. We're only five months old. We just received our 501c3 status from the IRS yesterday. Oh, wow. Congrats, Sequoia. Congrats. Yeah. Uh, we, we received initial funding from Penn which has been extremely helpful. However, I'm noticing as I'm looking for grants, a lot of them are invite only to apply. Any <laughs> suggestions for new nonprofits getting their work recognized by foundations or grants so we can get that invitation to submit a letter of intent or a proposal? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I just heard a, a grant um, uh, trustee say, I hate those. Um, so what... Again, you need to build relationship, right? So what the first thing you probably need to do is uh, go on LinkedIn, make sure you're connected on LinkedIn to all your board members and see who they know. Do they know any of the grant of the board members on the um, you know, your list of trustee of 
So you have your list of uh, prospects. And then find out who's on the board of those prospects. This is it's as labor intensive, but it can be very, very useful. So you find out, you know, here are my five top prospects, and here are the board, the trustees of those uh, those foundations. And then you go on LinkedIn and see if they know anybody that's on your board. That is a if you have the capacity to do that kind of research, that I promise you will get you a new grant. Because oftentimes, um, one board member will say to another board member at a different organization, hey, if you think about ours, we'll think about yours. And um, there's, a, a again, when I was a theater for a new audience, I was trying to get into this, uh, uh, okay, this is a long convoluted story, but I was trying to get money from Tiger Baron Foundation. Tiger Baron Foundation, funds arts and education. We had a very robust arts and education program. I found out that the trustee at the Tiger, it's a small foundation and they only have a handful of trustees, but the senior trustee was on the board at the public theater, which does Shakespeare. Theater for a new audience does Shakespeare. She kept, I found out from somebody I know that she kept pushing them to do more arts and education. Tefana does arts and education with Shakespeare. I'm like, she should be funding us. Then I found out, I, I can't remember. Oh, I found out that her ex, not, not her husband, her her um, her husband who has since passed um, was a Princeton graduate. So I found out that their son was also a Princeton graduate. And then I found out that she was uh, one of our trustees and this woman, that I'm, the mother, both were on the board of this Brooklyn Botanical Garden. So then we wrote a letter from our uh, our trustee who was on the board of the Brooklyn Botanical Garden to give to this other woman who was the trustee at Tiger Baron. So um, that that proposal made it through there because I found out all these pieces and put them together. And then we ended up getting it, well, we ended up getting a check for $10,000 that was not signed, but <laughs> we ended up getting that signed. But um, so, you know, it's it can be about making those connections, finding the people who make the connections. So that's one way. Another way is to invite them to one of your programs. They may come, they may not, but start invite, start st what we call soft touches. What are soft touches? They're not asks. They're inviting to a, to a party, inviting to a performance, inviting to a rehearsal. Sooner or later, they'll be interested in what you do. And that goes back to my slide about the funder becoming aware of your organization. All right. We have a few more questions. I know we're getting close, but I feel like we can we can get at least most of these answered. Um, so Vincent says, you know, things like looking for and applying for foundational and government support, identifying and cultivating relationships with potential funders, creating collateral and materials to support your efforts seem like full-time jobs, all of them. So where would you recommend smaller teams start? Ha, ah, ha, ah, gosh. Um, smaller teams start. I think the first thing is um, making sure you have the pieces in place because those pieces, once they're in place, they, they're reusable. You can, you know, so that that's kind of a, an important step. Um, and if you have board members that can help, that can be uh, an incredible resource. I actually encourage you to look at your board and approach your board and saying, I need help putting this together. Is there anyone on this board who will help? Um, when I started at Theater for a New Audience, I actually, sorry, when I started at Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, MALDEF, um, they did not have a development person. Uh, the executive director did everything. And I was, I started on the board and um, I was in a job where that didn't take up a lot of my time. So I was like, I'll help. I'll help pull some of this stuff together. So, uh, you know, I worked with the executive director to pull stuff together. Um, and we had two other people who also helped pull stuff together. 
So if your board is not, if you're a small organization and you're new, you should have a board that is willing to step in and do stuff like that. Um, so that's your first step and starting to find those lists and make those introductions. Perfect. Okay, I have two more questions. I'm going to skip to Alberto's, which is a little bit more granular, and then I'll go to Christopher's, which is a bigger uh, question. So Alberto says, any advice regarding operating with a fiscal sponsor, best practices, and things to look out for? Oh, gosh. Um, that's hard. Um, I've never done that, so I don't have a lot of experience in that area. Um I think you want to make sure that they are uh, um, gosh, well, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I just make sure that your relationship is is strong and um uh, honest because otherwise, um I worked I did volunteer work for an organization uh, and they didn't, it wasn't a fiscal sponsorship. We were a program of the larger organization. And then that larger organization decided to close us down. And um, they did so without really uh, helping uh, the program move out on its own. And they wanted to sort of own all the funders, even though there were many funders that were funding that particular program. Um, yeah, I wish I could be more helpful, but I know that there's like a uh, fractured atlas and um, some of the other ones that you can talk to and, and hopefully they will have better resources than I'm able to, to kind of give you in that regard. All right. And go. Go yeah. Christopher's question, which is how do the introverts win in fundraising? <laughs> I'm going to say something crazy because I'm actually um technically an introvert um yeah when I did my Myers-Briggs you know it came out that I was an introvert and there were people that were like no you're not um that could be because I had 20 years on stage um I think introverts tend to listen more which is a good thing as a fundraiser uh and introverts still have the passion. So think about the passion. Think about why you, if you started a nonprofit, why you started that. If it if it's not you that started it, what drew you to work for that organization? Because God knows we don't go to nonprofits, especially in the arts, for the money, <laughs> right? We go because we care about it. We love the arts. We know how important they are. And I think if you can talk to that, um, gosh, I was at a, I was at an event yesterday um, at a foundation that does not fund us, but they fund another organization that I worked at, and um, which is why I got invited. And I was talking to the director, and I told him the story about a young person in one of our choirs, our, our boy choir, who used to sing with the girl choir, and. Um, I was talking to this young person's parents and I was talking to the mother really. And we were talking about the benefits of being in a choir, about how it's um, you uh, learn about teamwork. You learn about leadership. You join a community. You, f you get to express your voice. And we were talking back and forth and suddenly the father piped in and it saves lives. This choir saved my kid's life. I mean, I tell that story and it's it's it it kills me inside. It's so wonderful. You know, we're going on tour this summer and I can't half the young men in the ensemble asked to room with this this young singer. He is He's popular. He loves being in this group. And that's that's huge. Man, this kid is so happy now. He found his people. I think that's a beautiful note to end things on. 
Um, let me just spotlight myself so people can see me. Um, Lorraine, I just want to say thank you so much for, for being here with us, sharing all of these resources and anecdotes and stories, which are so helpful as well. Um, folks, you can see Lorraine's contact info on that last slide. I will also be following up with you all with this slide deck. Um, but we are so grateful to have you here today. So much appreciated. Um, folks, Please join us later today for the second session of the day. It's at four o'clock. We'll see you for a career pivot, teaching artist to arts administrator. Shout out to Sequoia, who is going to be on that panel. Um, and yeah, more soon. Lorraine, thank you so much. Have a wonderful thank rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye, all.